There are many great reasons to trick people into thinking you're fancy. You can impress someone you like, get invited to cool parties, or even get one new follower on Twitter. The problem is, how do you do it? Easy, just keep watching. Here are the top 10 ways to trick people into thinking you're fancy. Amazing. Number 10. Throw in an amazing dinner party. Dinner parties are often a way to acknowledge to friends that you have grown up, got a job, and don't live at home with your parents anymore. Throwing the perfect dinner party wouldn't only guarantee high fives at the end of the night, but also make you come across as a more refined, professional individual. Here's how to host a successful one. Ask guests not to bring their own food, as this could clutter the table or make things awkward. There's nothing worse than guests pretending to enjoy an English trifle like the one Rachel made in Friends. When guests arrive, you should be entertaining them instead of cooking with upbeat music playing in the background. Think of playing downtown funk instead of drum and bass. You want this party to be one to remember, which is achieved by being an excellent host. Try smiling a guest as they arrive, introduce them to other guests, and offer compliments or gratitude if they bring gifts, especially if it's alcohol related. Finally, leave a lasting impression when friends leave by helping them with their thanks and thank them for coming over. You're one step closer to becoming a refined, fancy adult. Number nine, using big words. Conversations can be a lot more fun when you use big words, but how do you do it effectively? Should you binge watch every season of Dawson's Creek or eat a dictionary? No, the first thing you should ensure is that you know the exact meaning of the complex word you're using. Often we assume that we know words from previous contexts we use them, or just because we've been using them for years. But don't count on your memory, because a mistake can be embarrassing. For example, it's easy to confuse similar words, but often their meanings are complete opposites, such as enervate, which means to drain, and energize, which means to give energy. The best thing to do is memorize the meanings of a small number of really neat words that can be easily interjected into normal conversations and convey them confidently. Here are some suggestions. Pause the video if you'd like to learn these fancy words to impress others with. Finally, don't use too many complex words in close proximity or overuse the same big word with many syllables that you heard off of Grey's Anatomy. This will come across as forced and then you'll look pathetic. The bottom line is, try to make a habit of absorbing as many complicated words as you can in your daily life. Number 8. Dressing for a formal event Getting invited to a formal event is always really exciting until you realize you have no idea how to dress. As the event approaches, you start to get stressed out trying to decide whether you need to buy something new to wear or if you already have the right clothes. In case you've never been to any of these events, then the guidelines for men are usually a conservative dark suit accompanied with a dress shirt and a tie. A belt that matches your shoes and dark socks are also a must. Flashy jewelry is not recommended, so go for something more subtle. Ladies can be a little more flexible to semi-formal events and opt for a pantsuit with a dressy fabric like silk or cashmere or a dress with heels or sandals. Sparkling gemstones and fashionable jewelry are appropriate too, but not necessary. Formal events require a bit more planning, however, especially if it comes to wearing a tux. A tuxedo must consist of a black evening jacket, black trousers, black cummerbund, dress shirt, bow tie, and shiny black shoes. Ladies can wear a full-length gown or a cocktail dress as long as the hemline or style isn't too revealing. Number 7. Having a polite conversation Good conversations are a key characteristic of an interesting person, but great conversations seem to indicate they're also rather fancy. There are a number of tips you should follow to have a polite conversation. For example, listen more than you actually talk and reply with interesting and thoughtful questions. This makes conversations flow more smoothly than normal. Under no circumstances should you partake in one-upping, aka attempting to sound more superior than the other person in the conversation, as this will make you seem insecure or just plain ignorant. Oversharing is also something to refrain from doing when you meet a new person. They shouldn't hear about your entire life story within two minutes of meeting. All in all, the number one rule you should follow is to act as natural as possible. Number six, talking about your travel experiences. If you've been traveling, you probably cannot wait to tell everyone what you've seen, the cool things you did, and the weird things you ate. The issue is that while you might be trying to come across as worldly or interesting, it may make you look bad instead. Talking about travel involves knowing your audience. Friends who travel as much as you will enjoy hearing about the wonders of the world. However, others who are unable to travel either won't care or don't want to know. Also, be honest when you do happen to talk about travel. People like to hear the bad stuff as much as the good. 
Give a preface that highlights your approach to travel, rather than the experiences you've had, such as how you like to get lost in a big city or hang out with locals over a meal. This helps you to express your travel values, which others can relate to. Don't be smug when you talk about your travel experiences, and if anyone is not asking genuine questions about what you did, then this is a hint that they are not interested. Moments like this should encourage you to bring the conversation back to them or make a graceful exit. Number five, bragging without sounding like a jerk. In life, we want to celebrate our achievements or goals because they're the results of hard work. Only if we celebrate all the time and brag about our accomplishments, we don't come across too well. There's nothing wrong with sharing your accomplishments, but there are ways of doing it that will leave a lasting impression instead of a lingering disdain. When talking about your successes, take a moment to reflect or explain about how grateful you are that you had the opportunity in the first place. Recognizing what you achieved and how not only makes you more memorable, but it also tends to differ from boasting. Include an element of self-deprecation too. Talk about your failures just as much and how you had to do the things you hated to get to where you are now. Humor is also a great way to share your story without being perceived as bragging. Number four, playing poker like a pro. Poker seems like a fairly simple game, but if you're in the company of friends or family, the last thing you want is to lose, as they won't let your failure slide anytime soon. Showing you have skills in this game could raise your social status and make you look fancy when really, you've just been practicing your poker face. You should have some understanding of the game before playing, otherwise, you're guaranteed to lose. It's really quite simple, as all you need to know are the different hierarchies of various combinations of cards. Knowing the type of players at your table is vital to winning, so here are the ones to watch out for and what to do. Let's start with a pre-beginner, usually a friend of a friend or a girlfriend. They don't normally play poker or know all the rules. It's best to avoid the pre-beginners as they don't know what cards they're holding, and thus, they're hard to read. Let everyone else try to figure them out while you focus on the other players. The beginner is next, and they make decisions based on the strength of the two cards they hold. If they're showing strength, then they won't shy away from placing bets, otherwise, they'll simply fold. Attempt to take down every hand that they're dealt, and if they play back or show any signs of strength, then let them have it, since they're probably not bluffing. Finally, watch out for players who consider themselves good. Try to spot these players early on in the game by looking for signs, such as if they talk about how great they are at poker, or if they talk about the exact odds your hand has. They attempt to bluff a lot, so you have to wait for them to make a dumb move at the wrong time before striking back. Number three, having basic table manners. You won't always need to know proper table manners in life, but if you're ever invited to your partner's special event, it might be worth looking into. First impressions can play a vital role in these kinds of situations, so try your best to remember a few of the following tips. Once you sit down at the table, place the napkin on your lap. Leave it there until the end of the meal, or if you excuse yourself from the table. There's probably more silverware on the table than a pirate ship, but when in doubt, work with the utensils from the outside and move in as the meal progresses. Dessert utensils are usually found above your plate. Rest the utensils properly by placing the knife and fork down at the bottom in a three o'clock position. To indicate you're finished eating, place your utensils in either a six or five o'clock position. Don't start eating until the host begins, even if other less fancy folks start beforehand. And after the party or event, make sure to send a thank you note within two weeks after the event. Number two, dancing at a wedding. Watching a newly married couple perform their first dance is always magical, but you may know in your heart that you could dance better. While everyone else might be fist bump in the air or twerking, you should resist the urge to join in and have a few moves of your own instead. If it's a formal event, you should assume this position for ballroom dancing, with the man cupping his partner's shoulder blade with his right hand, and the woman should place her left hand on the seams of his sleeve. From here, it's all about posture, so stand up straight and avoid bumping knees. The man should lead and step according to this configuration. If you're at a more standard wedding, chances are that you'll be expected to just dance normally. Here's a move you can adopt to prevent yourself from looking awkward on the dance floor. It's the I kind of know what I'm doing dance. Start with reaching down and stepping up as if you were putting on some trousers. Start moving your hips back and forth a little while you do so, and then to finish off the groove, add in some hand movements like kind of a karate chop look. It sounds a little confusing, so it's probably better to watch the full video demonstration first. Number one, how to taste wine like an expert. Tricking others into thinking you're fancy is best achieved by becoming a wine expert, or at least pretending to be one. Wine tasting events don't actually involve getting completely drunk. You take a sip, swish it around, and then casually spit it out. Then tell everyone about how amazing it was and all the different flavor profiles the fermented grape juice exhibited. 
under no circumstances should you gargle, as this will give away that you have no idea what you're doing. You're not tasting mouthwash. First, grip the glass at its base with your thumb and forefinger and pour a small 5 to 6 ounce serving. Hold the glass up and look at its color. To you, it's probably either red or white, but to an expert, they can determine the age, grape variety, and amount of sugar or acidity in the wine. Next, give it a smell. Maybe make a hmm sound as you do so. The aroma indicates what's in the wine. If it's something you recognize such as citrus, then tell everyone. Just don't say something stupid like diapers. White wines tend to have an apple or lemon aroma, while red wines smell more like cherries and plums. Next, take a small sip of the wine. Sweetness is usually the first thing you could taste. The body of the wine is what you're looking for here. When you swish it around your mouth, does it feel like skimmed, semi-skimmed, or whole milk? A strong body is a wine with high alcohol content, so its texture would feel a lot more viscous and hence more similar to whole milk. Now spit the wine out into a bucket and then tell everyone your conclusion. Maybe throw in a word like oaky, earthy, or fruity to start off. Of course, the more experienced wine tasters will take lead in the discussion, so you can observe what they say and decide to agree or not. If you taste more than one wine, cleanse your palate by drinking water or having a cracker. If you're eating food simultaneously, also take note of the food and wine pairings. Light wines tend to go with lighter foods, like chicken and veggies, while stronger red wines are better suited for heavier foods, like carbs and red meat. Will you adopt any of these tricks to fool others into thinking you're fancy? Are there any tricks you know that I didn't include in the list? Let me know in the comments down below. Thanks for watching.